to week four of the marketing pre-record sessions brought to you from the late night downtown hub of inactivity that is the ANU CBE 26 building after hours. This week we are dealing with consumer behaviour. As with the previous week of market research, this is another topic area where we have a full dedicated subject. And much like market research, you are going to get a highlights package and pointed to things that will take place next year or next semester or whatever it is you're doing in your behaviour. But unlike market research, there's a lot more consumer behaviour that you can apply here and now this semester in your coursework, in your marketing plans, and in your own life. Now one of the things on the feed forward sheets at the start of the semester is a lot of people ask about aspects to do with consumer behaviour. What are the tricks to getting us to act the way you want us to act? What are some of the techniques? How do I, as a consumer, end up buying things or making decisions? And how are marketers influencing my choices and my decisions? So hopefully with this chapter and this week, we should be able to start tapping in to answers to some of those questions and some of those things that you want to know about a subject area get addressed in this season and this series. So to keep this off, the first thing you want to be thinking about is this question of who is the consumer, who is the person that you are going to be addressing. Now we're going to talk about the consumer at a uh, generic level as a concept, as a framework. In the following lecture, in the following chapter, we start talking about target markets, where we start talking about the consumer in terms of very specific details and specific requirements. But for this week, it's enough to know that the consumer is the person the ultimate user of goods, ideas or services. At the moment, it's a person. We are probably a couple of generations of technology away from it being a machine. Whilst we have things that can print their own component parts and self-replicate, none of them have an income stream and they can't buy their own goods off the internet yet. But it is actually possible that at some point our smartphone could go and detect that its battery life was getting less powerful than it would like and it orders a new battery and books an appointment for itself to be taken in for servicing. This is technically feasible and when it starts happening we open up a new line of consumers. But at the moment we're dealing with people, people who have needs, and people who have wants. Now the needs and wants were raised first in week one, they are a core idea. With something like needs and wants, what you are looking to do with this knowledge is to be able to apply it. To be able to say, am I going to address a need which is the difference in the state between where you are and where you want to be? And if so, what is the best way to address this that is appropriate for your audience and is a culturally or socially appropriate? So to take a need and to convert it to a want. And that's one of the things that basically allows you to move and make some influence, influential decisions in terms of our need might be for security. So we can turn that into a want, and that want can be, I wish to feel secure, I will take a self-defense class, I will buy a can of mace, I will buy extra security screens for my home, I will buy a large four-wheel drive. All of these are needs, but the way in which they are actualized, I will take control of my own life, I will arm myself against others, 
I will shield myself against others, I will build a fortress, I will acquire a mobile fortress. That basically is the wants. So moving between needs and wants is going to be a um, important and useful factor for you to think uh, through and to consider as you're developing your own plans and what it is you intend to do. And also what you intend to address in your marketing plan. Okay, so what do we do in consumer behaviour and why, do we, why does it count and why does it matter? Well, first thing is, consumer behaviour is just that, is the behaviour of the people who are going to use our products, take on our needs and wants. And what we look for here though is, as marketers, our interest is in the combination of the environmental factors. Now, environment itself will get a little bit of definition, but basically it is the context in which you will consume or the context in which you will purchase. <coughs> the second thing that we look for are the influences that operate on the individual that we are targeting. So we're looking at the external influences, the social pressure, the peers, the family, the normative pressures. All of these are technical issues that we discussed, but basically anything that resides outside the consumer is either part of the environment or part of the external influences. And then we look at the internal influences. And this is the interesting part because we start looking at the consumer's experience, their personality, what it is that defines them as an individual and how they see themselves and their role and their place in the world. So, the big thing for you in this is you are going to engage in marketing plans that are going to give you the opportunity to work through some of this interaction and effect. Some of this approach of are we going to put a product out based on its cognitive, rational, reasonable approach or are we going to put it out on its emotional, reasonable approach? Because logic and emotion are both reasonable responses to marketing. Now, in the decision making process, uh, I have this particular model when I teach consumer behaviour that I am very fond of referring to as the cheese wheel of death. It will make an appearance. Basically, you have a series of steps, five or six steps, and across this whole process you are making decisions. You are choosing one brand versus another, one product versus another, a location of where to buy versus a do I buy online versus in the store? Do I buy from the vending machine or walk across to the convenience store? Do I buy in bulk earlier and carry with me? Do I pay a premium for ease of access at the time I want the stuff? Now some of it can be really complex, well thought out, reasoned decisions. These are usually for big ticket items, but they're also for things that you care about. You may have agonized over the choices um, and decisions as to which subjects you wanted to take. Or you may have taken the subjects because an advisor said this is a good path. Or your friend has taken the subject and you want to hang out with them for a couple of years. All of these, though, should be considered valid approaches. One of the risks when we start talking about decision making and how people make decisions and how consumers engage in this process is it's a little bit easy to get judgmental. It's a little bit easy to think, oh, well, you did that on an emotional response, a quick emotional response, versus this consumer who took a long, logical, thought out process. Well, if they both result in a satisfied consumer, you're good to go. Don't, don't start thinking that there are superior processes for cultural norms around either logic or emotion, around rationality versus, uh, well, even the idea of rationality versus non-rational decision making, 
In fact, we call it non-rational rather than emotive. So watch for baggage, watch for cultural elements here, and also know that what may look like a spur of the moment, instant, uninformed choice could actually be the result of someone being far more experienced in their product decision making than you are because they don't have to think it through anymore. They're in fact good at the decision. So you with your long thought out, drawn out, reasoned, rational processes might actually be the lesser of the two decision makers because you don't have sufficient experience to make a fast decision. Now, uh, we're getting into the good stuff. This is the first of the big models. Now, for many of you, one of the things that you were concerned about with the subject was, will there be too much theory? Oh no, how do I handle theory? What do I do with theory? This framework is a theoretical framework. This is a theory. It's presented to you as a closure, it's presented to you as a model. It is a way to describe the complexity of human thought and human decision making in a manageable package that you can work your way through to see whether your marketing activities are actually addressing aspects of the decision process, whether you are actually going to be able to influence a consumer in a positive way or a negative way by a provision of information, experience or opportunity. So if we look at this from the idea of a sequence. And the important thing here is that the sequence starts with problem recognition. The first thing that you need to know as a marketer is that when we talk about problem recognition, we talk about it as a spelt out, thought out, reasoned, very explicit outcome. It doesn't necessarily take place like that in reality. It's just a lot easier for us to actually break it down and make use of it if we go and say, well, problem recognition is the first step. Problem recognition can be something as basic as the I am hungry, therefore I need food. Problem recognition, I have hunger, I wish to resolve hunger. It can be as complicated as I am needing to provide a operational working space for 20 employees to be able to produce um, a series of packaged goods and on the production line and a front office and a lot of complexity. It can be a whole swing from I'm hungry to I'd like to set up dot com. All of that is in problem recognition. What is the gap between your current state and your desired state? Problem recognition is the acknowledgement of needs and wants. Once you realize that there is a problem and think here marketing definitions. The British definition, the Chad Institute definition leans a little towards the problem of anticipation. So anticipate and satisfy is identify, anticipate, satisfy is in putting some of the emphasis here on the problem recognition. Saying can we actually work out the consumer is going to have a problem a bit before the consumer does so we can have the right things waiting for them to go yeah, hungry, hmm, want to satisfy that. Hey, there's a vending machine outside the lecture theatre. Or, hey, there's a coffee cart that sells food and coffee outside the lecture theatre. So, being able to be at the right place, which is on the back of your market research and some of the knowledge of market from that particular area. The search function is split between internal and external. On the internal search, you are going through your memory. You are looking for a previous experience, either with the product or um, knowledge you have of advertising or reviews or other content. You then have the external search. Now again, 
we're splitting this up as explicit boxes on a diagram so you can path map your way through and look at this as an event that takes either place linear or in sequence. But you'll notice very quickly that this diagram loops around a lot because this is how thinking functions work. So you go from search, you look through the search process, you look for external materials, you look for the materials that the marketers have produced, this is their advertising, this is their products, this is the experience we control. This is our marketing things. This is the stuff you're going to talk about in the marketing plan. But we also have the non marketer control materials. Things like your friends' experience, your friends' opinions of products, or the opinions of reviewers on websites and bloggers and other places, so that there is a combination, a series and sequence of internal and external materials. The external materials run through a set of mental processes exposure, attention, comprehension, acceptance, retention. Each of those allows, and there's a loop here between attention, the more attention you pay, the more likely it is to sit in your memory, but having paid more attention, the more likely it is to be easier to remember, having been, if it's easier to remember, you've probably got a better understanding of it, so your comprehension's up, you get your acceptance of it because it's part of you now, it's part of your memory, that's increased and it loops around. The more involved you are in something, the easier it is for you to remember it. And then, the other thing that comes out of memory is that memory itself can trigger problem recognition, putting you right back at the top of the loop. Isn't this glorious for how well it um, hooks around? Now, assuming that you get out of memory, your internal search and your external search result in you having a series of choices to make. Keep our basic example, we've got the I'm hungry. Your choices are, you know that within 15 minutes walk there's a decent place to eat. You know that within two minutes walk there is a vending machine with pretty ordinary food. You know within 30 minutes there'll be a pizza. You have had now a series of choices. And how you act on those choices is influenced by the aspects of belief, attitude, and intention. Beliefs and attitude are themselves influenced by your personality traits, your social influences. If you're in a community of people who are prone to, say, this whole CrossFit craze, you're unlikely to go to the pizza if they're around the place, or you may be extremely likely to go to the pizza if you can justify to the group that, hey, it's just this once. We also have the situation of environmental factors. And the situational influences could be it's raining, it's cold, it's wet, it's damp, the vending machines within two minutes walk undercover, dry, versus 15 minutes, cold, wet, versus calling out for pizza and spending 10 minutes standing out in the cold and wet waiting for the delivery. So there are other factors in play here. All of these look around to two key outcomes. Outcome number one is actually the purchase. This is where you go, I want the product. And outcome number two is, what happens post-purchase? Are you satisfied or dissatisfied? If you are dissatisfied, you're probably going to go right back to the proper recognition process to start again. If you're satisfied, that will influence your memory, your beliefs, your attitudes towards the product, your intentions for future repurchase. So it will have a positive, most of the time, a positive effect. Now, the thing I want you to do with this model is I want you to look at the input and the information processing aspects, particularly exposure, attention, perception, acceptance, retention, memory. Look at this sequence block. 
read over the theory, read over the chapter section, and then ask yourself, how do I use this knowledge of exposure, of attention, perception, acceptance, to improve my retention of marketing knowledge so that when I go into the exam room, I will have the ability to pull from my internal search, from my own memory, as quickly as I can from the external search, from the uh, materials that you bring with you. So make use of those factors. Look at how can you influence your own study using these frameworks. Okay, time to play a couple of key marketing theories. Out involvement, this is one of the big ones that everyone really loves. Basically, how important is the decision to you? I'm using involvement theory on this semester to the extent that for a given exercise, the weighting of it, if I weight an assessment task in the course, I will get greater levels of involvement and attention because you have a payoff and a reward. But also, at the same time, it's the perceived consequences. How important are these consequences? When I line up a series of sequential events that you step through, so you have an assessment task that gives you feedback into the next assessment task, that gives you feedback into the final assessment task, and each of the assessment tasks gets slightly bigger and heavier weighting, it's worth the effort, it's worth being involved in the first task because it's increasing the likelihood of the consequences being positive. Or not being involved increases the likelihood of the consequences being negative. Again, the important thing about consequences being positive or negative is that is a statement of a neutral nature. It's not a, a, a negative outcome for the consumer is something that will result in a loss for the consumer. It's, it's neither good nor bad from our perspective as marketers. It is something to judge, assess, and decide whether how you want to address and how you want to proceed. Okay, so involvement rolls between two spectrums, two ends of the spectrum. Low involvement has very little risk. It's very fast processing because the consequences don't really matter. For most people, this is your choice of soft drink, a snack at lunch, a snack between meals, uh, the average daily you know, food consumption. It is also the end game most marketers want to get to. Most of us in marketing want to be playing in low involvement. We want to be just part of the background cluster of your life, just a continuous thing that is there. On the other hand, high involvement is something that people think about. It has a certain risk to it. And you make careful decisions and you consider a lot of choices, you do a lot of research. The higher the level of the involvement, the more likely you are to look at what competing alternatives and different products. So as a marketer, as a defensive aspect, you want to have people down in low involvement. You want them thinking, well, you don't really want them thinking at all. You want them using routine, memory, and learned patterns of behavior to keep them low. But if you want to get those same customers across to your new brand or to a new brand or take them from a rival brand, you are going to have to raise their level of involvement to get them to start thinking so that they are conscious, making conscious choices in terms of product switching. You can see where this is going to go is that your optimum state is a low involvement consumer who's not paying attention, your, and that's your loyalty or attention crew, but your optimum state to gain new people involves high involvement. So you have to balance between getting people to think about the products and not getting them to think about the products. All right, risk. This is a good one because this also is probably the most immediate real to life influences you on a daily basis theory you're going to come across in here. Perceived risk is basically the likelihood of there being 
the belief in the likelihood of there being a negative outcome. So, price, the complexity, um, and the embarrassment factor. So, perceived risk can often be a, an expense from the consumer's perspective of, look, I really love this product, but I don't really want to be publicly associated with it. Um, you basically, again, are looking at things on risk. It's really worth processing this, really worth looking through, because some of the behaviours you have to undertake at university are inherently risky. In exams, where you've got choice between different, you've got to pick two from three, that is a risk that you are going to take. Did I pick the right one? So getting to process risk and deal with risk is a quite useful thing. Okay, the table, um, what I, when you come across tables in the text, what I want you to do is look at them from the perspective of this is a summary of knowledge, this is a checklist of knowledge, and this is probably something that would be kind of useful if you look down the site here. Product, level involvement, perceived risk, information processing, learning model, required marketing action. This would be a great set of a great procedural thing for you to be doing in your marketing plan as a set, sorry, in your marketing planning in the process leading up to writing the marketing plan to be able to go and say, well, what's my product? Is it extended? Is it habitual? Is it somewhere in between? And then work your way through. Well, what's the expected involvement? What's the sort of risk? And work through this table, but do this actual notes. Do this as something that you don't put in the plan documents. You use it to make decisions, to run through, to check, yes, you cover all the bases, yes, you understand what you're offering, and that will influence. Again, it becomes second-hand knowledge of something you learn, but something you don't necessarily use in the plan directly. All right, so we're heading into the decision-making process, which is always the fun part. This is a great, great area. Uh, usually, if you're teaching the consumer behavior, if you're doing selling consumer behavior, you only get a week per box. Here you're going to get about five minutes. So, stepping through, the problem recognition. The gap between the current state and the actual states. All of you are going to experience this in a, a very specific manner, and that is, you've all been challenged and tasked with assessment questions both in this course and in others. And your current state will be, I haven't written this paper. Your desired state is, I'd like my marks, please. How do you go current state to ideal states? That's what you're going to be trying to do. You're also in this, in a sense, that marketing can trigger problem recognition. We can work on saying there is a desired state that you could attain that you don't currently have. This is probably best um, identified through the American Marketing Association. The AMA 2007 definition which talks about the creation. Creation is basically a process of saying here is a solution to a problem, or here is something that should trigger you to go, I am not in my ideal state because I do not have the possession of this product, I have not received, or I have not received the service. So you can trigger recognition of, hey, there's a problem. Because there was that moment where you were pretty content with the world, and then you hear a song on the radio and suddenly you need, the life is incomplete because you do not own the music of this artist, or this, you do not own this album. And it's that basic of, you encounter a product, or you see a demo of a product, or you see a message about a product, and you go, I want that, from a recognition is on. Okay, step two, information search. Internal, external. Dustin and Dover does briefly talk about, but basically, having gone, yes, I have a problem, you start to think, how do I solve my problem? What do I do? 
The internal search is past experience. So if you've encountered this problem before, hmm, I am out of, I would buy a drink. Well, yeah, I, okay, most people have got a whole suite of, I'm thirsty, I can work out, so here's a range of different products I could have. That's your internal search. I'm not gonna try that one because it didn't taste really great last time. That's your past experience, like, oh, that was, I went, I'm hungry, I went to this place, they had a great um, pad thai, I will go back there again, past experience. The external search can be controlled deliberately, as in you go out and say, I want to find out uh, what is available. I, I'm in the market for a new laptop, I will intentionally go out and expose myself to marketing messages about laptops, computers, iPads, notepads, whatever it is I want to look for. Or you can encounter this and it becomes resident in your memory. And then you go, or you deliberately seek out product demos. There are a whole bunch of different ways to external search and function. The third step is that you then make decisions. And this is really interesting in that we all have a value to criteria that we use subconsciously. In consumer behaviour, we ask you to spell out this subconscious process as a deliberate and conscious choice. And it gets a little odd at times because when we're explaining the steps we went through to make a decision, they make sense in our head and it's good for us and it's a great platform for our decision making, but it's not always really easy to explain and some of the marketing mechanisms we use are based around market research and doing quantitative measurement. So we ask people to assign rankings and weightings and you get some very awkward and artificial frameworks, all of which are ways of describing the very fast internalised processes we go through in our own heads and our own minds. The key to this section though as a marketer is that you can influence the selection of the alternative because if you know that the market and the consumer that you are addressing prioritises a certain characteristic or a certain type of uh, feature or potential benefits, you can highlight that and point towards the match between you have, you're aware you have consumers who are thrill seekers, you can emphasize excitement, fun, adventure as your keywords in your advertising. Or you've got consumers who are risk averse, your words are safe, your color is blue, your shapes are boxes and circles, you have pictures of oceans, calming things, safe things, defensive things. Your logo is a stylized chess piece. There are ways to trigger, that are uh, ways to signal to the market that on the evaluation criteria that you will use to decide about this product, we score quite highly and we would be something you would be interested in. Okay, the product choice. There are several layers that in play here. One of them is the concept of the satisfice, and that is this product meets a portion of my needs. I accept some of my needs will remain unfulfilled. I will then seek a second or third product to meet the rest of the needs. You also have aspects in terms of the product choice. You have other elements of the marketing mix at play here. Uh, you can be quite keen, have your whole framework, everything you want to buy, and the product is not available at the store, so you'll take your second or third choice. You may have the trade-off between price and that which you desire, and that which you can afford. And don't forget, that can also be time. That which you desire, which takes 15 minutes to get to, and that which you can put up with, which is within a minute, and you've got five minutes to get to class, the price, the time price. You may also find people who are strictly brand loyal. 
who even when faced with an out of product, out of stock error, will go, okay, I will not make a purchase. It's either my brand or it's nothing. There is no alternatives. Quite often that's based on the feature experience. There's something completely beneficial to them about this product that makes it worth not having a, a competitive alternative. Now the thing on this, the note is, you know, there's a wonderful note here, the repeat purchases are often accompanied by an underlying cost of attitude, or you've got no better choice. So the thing is, don't mistake repeat purchase for loyalty. If you are the only, if there's a limited range of choices and you're putting up with the least worst option to make do, and a better choice comes along, you, will, you are not loyal. You will move to that better choice. Okay, step five, post purchase evaluation. This is where we've got a great piece of theory, the uh, perceptions expectations theory. It comes out of services marketing, and this is basically, in summary, your satisfaction is the sum of what you expected minus what you perceived. So if you go into a movie expecting it to be a life-changing experience of amazing magnitude, and you come out and it was all right, you're going to be more disappointed in your film choice than if you went in expecting it to be a, well, we're going to say this, it's going to be a joke, it's not that, yeah. No real expectations, either no expectations or things going bad, and it turns out to be equally as okay as the other movie, you actually have a more positive feeling about this because your expectations were exceeded. So managing perception expectation is a really, really interesting and really important part of marketing because you have to have the balance between having expectations sufficiently high that it makes it worth someone's time buying your product, but you also have to deliver on that through the perceptions of the product and the product experience. So it's really important to make certain you don't promise what you can't deliver and that you deliver slightly more than you promised. Knowing, however, there's nothing that's ever easy. The expectations for next time will be coloured by what they have experienced. And this is why when you go to a restaurant for a second time and order the same dish that was just mind-blowingly amazing the first time, it's never as good. It can't ever meet that first perceptions, expectations, calculation. You had no expectations, your perceptions were, uh, this is amazing. You go back second time, it's scoring on, uh, this is amazing, on the expectations. The perception is unlikely to be able to equal or beat that first yawning gap. And we can actually score these things on numerical charts and do some interesting uh, quantitative work around this. But the most important thing for you is that you want to make certain that you are meeting or exceeding. Okay. The uh, Influences on consumer decision making. All right, this is a big chunk of information. This is a big block of data. So, what we need to look at in here is in terms of how to use this information. Now, when you encounter a model like this in marketing, and particularly this subject. What you are looking at is an opportunity to run your ideas against a set framework. So in determining what will influence the consumer to buy your product, you have now a series of categories of ideas to work with. And this would be sitting inside your notes inside your working materials in the marketing planning process, but may not necessarily actually get reported that in much depth, in much detail. In the marketing plan, there is a section on consumers. 
but there's not enough room to describe everything here. So what you do is you take this model, you work through the steps and say, what is the most critical? What is the most important item on the internal influences that will make a difference for my product with this market, with this consumer? What's the most important social influence? So what's the most important situational influence? Now the social influence as well, this is where you need to start linking ideas back together. When we talk about the definition of a want, a want is a way of socially appropriately satisfying a need. Social influence therefore can address and modify wants. Internal influences are likely to address, create, modify needs. But the internal influences themselves can also then be used to either encourage people to work with the social influences or to work against them. So quickly, briefly, breaking it down, component part by component part, as for the component parts we have this year. Perception basically is selection, organization, interpretation of information. Perception is really interesting. Because as you start going through this, you can start feeling it working. In a given lecture, particularly this one, you are exposed to audio-visual. You get to hear my voice, you get to see my slides. But you can't see me. So my physical presence is one less piece of information for you to process, so you might find it a lot easier to actually process the slides without seeing me pacing around the place. At the same time, you may find it harder to deal with this because you are automatically imagining, and part of your brain's processor cycles are being taken up rendering a version of me in your head walking up and down the lecture theater. Now, the principle here of exposure, attention, interpretation, this is borrowed out psychology, so this, all psychology students uh, who are looking for how does mark and psychology overlap. Well, this is your territory. It's an old theory, but it still checks out for us. And the critical elements are exposure, the stimulus must be within. You have to be able to notice the message, to hear the message, to be exposed to it. If you don't detect the message is present, it doesn't work. There is no subliminal. There is no subliminal. There is no subliminal process in play here. If you haven't seen it, the stimulus hasn't triggered your senses, it hasn't worked. Secondly, then, is you also need to pay attention. And this is what I love on this, is that mere exposure is not enough. Standing in a bus shelter with a set of bags on the walls behind you, yes, you were exposed to them, no, you didn't pay attention to them. You were sitting on a bus that's advertising there. You weren't paying attention to it, you didn't care, you wouldn't be able to tell me what was on that bus. We've been finding the same thing with TV, is if you're not paying attention, it's not being stored both our, the adverts and the show, to be honest here. And interpretation. This is the third step. And the process is, you actually have to make sense of the stimulus that you see. And this is one of the interesting aspects is, first you have to be aware it's there, then you have to pay attention to it, and then you have to interpret it and make sense of it. And, uh, that's those other rapid needs. Hi, if everyone is recognizing this from some other subject, it's back. Alright. I briefly just want to say one more thing on the exposure, attention, interpretation. Is one sensory receptors. But attention and interpretation are critical aspects here, particularly interpretation. In this subject, one of the reasons why I'm asking you to undertake certain Assessment tasks is it lets you actually work through the interpretation process. 
why I don't want you using copy and paste and doing direct quotes is that you're not getting to practice interpretation if you do that. And interpretation is really a critical skill in being able to make sense of the world. And there's a marker to be able to make sense of the world, package that sense of, into a communicable message and send it out to someone else. Okay. Now we're the bit that I really wanted to kind of flag to you. This chapter is really interesting for you to use as a self-diagnostic system. For you to actually go and say, hang on, there's a bunch of theory on learning and I am engaged in a learning process in this subject. How does this work? What aspects of this describe me? What aspects of this can I adapt to my own life? How can I make use of this? So what we're looking for in learning is a uh, mostly permanent change in behaviour. And I've been talking a lot of behavioural cues to you thus far. Four weeks in, and I've been giving you instructions to observe, to watch. When you walk into a shop, to look. To become an active consumer, an active engaged, switched on, processing individual when you are walking into environments that contain a decent amount of marketing. That's behaviour. So I'm getting you to do that, but I'm also getting you to think and think about things. Alright. What I want to point flag to you here is when you've got things like the classical, the operants, and stimulus, look at these from the perspective of which one of these best describes how you learn. Classical conditioning, is that your style? Is that your thing? Uh, are you good with operant conditioning? Do you need to motivate yourself with a small piece of chocolate in order to uh, read a chapter? Do you give yourself the task of, if I don't get this chapter read by 9 o'clock tonight, it's washing up time for me? How, how do you work? Do you work to the operant? Stimulus stimulisation is one of the things we try and teach you. Try and get you to transfer existing associations to new to similar. This is why we're asking you to think about how the wires connect and cross-connect in marketing, how things are interwoven and interlinked, because this is making use of this process of transferring associations. So again, look at these theories and say, well, what works for you? What works for me? What's the, what's the best approach? Can I gain and learn from something? Alright, the attitudes aspect, again, briefly to talk to you about what uh, you need to be using here. Again, this is just an introduction, this is a high welcome to concept, we spent a bit of time on this in the other uh, courses. But for you, affect, behaviour, cognition are these things you want to be looking to. Affect, the emotive, the behaviour, the doing, and the cognition, the thinking. It is very easy for you to come to dislike studying, and it's very easy for you to create a very strong negative effect, a very strong emotional resistance to engaging in study and engaging in the university work that you have come here to do. You have come to learn. You have chosen this path. It is what you wanted to meet that need to go from my desired stage is I do not know to a desired stage of I know much more. But it's really easy for you to fall off the path of seeing this as a positive, learning is a challenge, this content is difficult, yes, I'm, yes, this is what I came here for, I want a challenge, I'm going to rise to that challenge. This is my time. Be aware of this. The, the attitude is something that you learn. It is taught to you quite often by yourself. If you tell yourself negative things about study, you will come to find study to be a bad thing. If you tell yourself positive things about studying, you find yourself 
wanting to study. It's not, oh, my life is terrible, I had to stay home on Friday night and study. It's like, this? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 look, guys, yeah, I'll catch you later. Uh, look, yeah, I'm off to, I, I, I want to see what happens next in this, or I'm really enjoying working on this project. I want to do some more of it. And that's a good thing. That's a thing that you can learn. So your affect is taught and learnt. Your emotional responses can be taught. Your behaviours can be taught and your cognition, your way of thinking through. Your logic and reasoning on this. Every experience you're going to have in this subject, you have chosen. This is the bonus. Everything that happens in here, you have chosen to come here and study. Ride the wave. Enjoy the experience. But also, process the experience. Look at how it works. Look at how it's put together. Okay, the last element I'm going to dust past. I want you to read these. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about them because they become important in terms of traits. Personality, the sets of traits that are really important actually in this subject. And the reason why these are up here is I want, to, I want you to, again, think about how they apply to you and how you find them fitting your life. Top of the list, though, is innovativeness. I've mentioned it a few times. I've brought it in as a framework. The degree to which you like new things. The thing about learning and this course and everything you've come for in this university is that it is a constant flow of new ideas. I've been teaching marketing for 15 years. I have taught intro to marketing now five years in a row. These are not new ideas to me, but to you, these are new frameworks, these are innovations, these are new shiny things. If you like novelty and you like innovation, you are probably going, tell me more, give me more. If you do not like novelty and you're not prone to innovation, you are probably trying very hard to limit and minimize the number of new things you encounter and that this is a bit of a disaster because you're being thrown new things left, right and center. But innovativeness, again, has a whole bunch of frameworks around it. If you are really innovative, you can pick up new ideas quickly, but you have difficulty sticking with them. If you're less innovative, you might find a balance between you will stick with the project, but it's harder to get you started. The other three things that are important on here for you this semester. Self-confidence. There's plenty of second-hand ego for, um, to go around, so your self-confidence will get worked on just as a matter of being near me and around me. That's a given. It's an outcome. Sociability. How much emphasis do you need for personal interaction? This is why the solo project exists, because you can run solo, because not everybody likes the interaction. And I don't force people into interactions because, honestly, I have a reasonably low sociability score. I have a high innovativeness, high self-confidence, low sociability. Which means I will be off there playing with new toys and new shiny things by myself to see how they work, breaking them, trying them out, but moving on, and not really worrying what people think about me. And the final aspect we want to be considering is what where do you lie on the spectrum of need for cognition? Do you need to think about things or can you react to things? Do you need to process? Do you have gut feel? How does it work for you? Look through these things and try and identify where you sit as an individual, where you're at, what are your personality traits, how do they work together? Alright, the uh, final thing on this, I'll just point you through this elements of the self, lifestyles, all these elements, all these pieces, have a read of, they are important. But the main things for, to wrap up, because we're heading on to the, uh, near out the hour of the pre-record. The last aspect that needs to be discussed is that there is 
a situational aspect of consumer behavior. We've talked mostly about personal characteristics. Product characteristics we've left off a little bit because it's going to come in later. But here, one of the keys is the context, the situation. And these are critical marketing questions to ask. Where will your marketing take place? Where will your communication, where will your distribution, where will the consumer be in and what context will they be in when they are looking at your product with intention to purchase, or where will they be when they're buying your product or using your product? So the situations here, the communication situation, Again, it's a question of if attention, if exposure requires perception of the message and attention requires actual acknowledgement and dealing with the message, where is the communication taking place? Is it is the surrounding noise? Are you alone? Are you with others? Are you in a crowded lecture theatre full of people with doing things and talking about stuff? Are you sitting on your own with headphones somewhere listening to the, a pre-recorded lecture? Are you... How is the communication situation taking place? The purchase. Where are... What's the time pressure? What are the constraints? Do you have plenty of time and the opportunity to read the labels? Or do you only have a few minutes and you've just got to grab what you can see and recognise? Like, okay, I think that's my brand. Yeah, that, 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 done. Got to go. Do you have a time pressure on you because there's a deadline. Birthdays, you've got to have the gift purchased, the whole process run through, gift acquired, gift purchased, and ready for presentation by a set point on the calendar. Music situation, where are you going to be consuming this? Amongst friends, with family, by yourself, with crowds of strangers, all of these things change the dynamic of what is important, what features, what matters to you. Is it a purchase for business? Is it a purchase for pleasure? All of these, again, matter in terms of the influence they will play on what is an important product characteristic. Now, if you are looking at a product that predominantly is to be used for work with other people, Versus a product that's to be used by yourself without anyone knowing you've got it, these are going to be wildly different categories. But the other thing with usage situation is, is the product just for you or is the product something that's going to be shared? Is the product divisible? Are you making a purchase for someone else that you'll make the purchase by yourself but the usage will be with others? So that not only do you have to consider your needs, but you have to consider the group's wants. And finally, the disposal situation. How, how do you get rid of this thing? Do you sell it? Do you throw it out? Does it time expire? Will it still be there in 20 years' time if you don't act, take active steps to remove it? What happens with the packaging? What happens with the material surrounding it. So there are a bunch of considerations. These show the influence of both distribution and some of the extended product on the needs and the influence on the purchase decision. And finally, in terms of situation and distribution, the last thing to be addressed on this pre-record the situation influences the product choice because the situation can create a context that without the given scenario, without the situation, there's no reason to purchase. You'll find things like convenience products, like vending machines, where you need a context in order to make the purchase worthwhile and useful so that you've got the situation will determine, okay, you're sitting at a bus stop, it's 
10 minutes to the bus, it's cold, there's a coffee machine, it's worth a coffee. That coffee is going to be found, and you not willingly choose this coffee if there are alternatives, but in the situation and in the context, it is a good reasoned choice. All right, I'll get you to look over the situational influences, the component parts, shoot that one for yourselves. And that's it, that's a wrap. That is the pre-record for week four in the bag.